so far in this course, when we've been talking about actors in international politics, we've been talking either about states or in our last uh, bunch of videos, we were talking about uh, things inside of states, right? Interest groups, um, bureaucracies, individual leaders, and so on. In this next uh, set of videos, we're talking about actors that are not states and are not inside of states, but either are above states or cut across states or just really have different kinds of relationships with states. And so uh, it's really important to think about the, the range of actors international, in international politics and a lot of research is going on these days as to how these other kinds of actors interact with states and how international politics looks uh, once we get beyond the notion that states are the only actors. So in this first video, um, we're gonna we're gonna focus on international organizations. Uh, you know, intuitively, I think we all know what we're talking about, and the textbook goes into some definition. Um, but the the point I want to make here is just to stress that in when we talk about international organizations, at least in the narrow sense, we're talking about organizations whose members are nation states themselves, right? So that each country that's part of the organization, right, is represented as a country. Now, a few of these organizations will sometimes uh, ask for informal representation by, by some kinds of non-governmental actions, but, it, but these are ones that are controlled by states, by groups of states, and the representation is by states. And one question to ask is, is why states form international organizations, right? States want to be sovereign. They guard their sovereignty very jealously, so why do they form international organizations? Uh, they do it uh, in a general sense because there's a whole bunch of problems or jobs that they want to do that they can't really get done uh, without international organizations, or to put it slightly differently, that are a lot cheaper and easier to do if you just form an organization to do it. <clears throat> so exam for example, um, if you have an agreement like the European Human Ni Rights Agreement, uh, you might say uh, the easiest way to administer the agreement to make sure everybody's following the rules and help people know what the rules are and so on is to form some organization, right? So you basically, everybody pays in some money or delegates some staff and, um, and you create the European Human Rights Commission and, and they do their work. Um, so sometimes it's to administer agreements. And a lot of agreements will have a small secretary attached to them to do the work of, of helping the states implement the agreement. Um, but in many cases, they're doing more than just administering an agreement. They're actually doing work and lots of work for the states uh, that want it done, and, and because the work might cut across multiple states, uh, um, it helps to have an organization that cuts across states to do it. So a great example right now is, is what we call WHO, uh, or the World Health Organization, right, which, which does um, immense work across the world, uh, tracking the outbreak of new diseases and trying to help uh, combat all kinds of diseases um, in, in a way that, that takes account of the fact that diseases don't respect borders very well. And, and so whether we're talking about uh, COVID, which is uh, obviously the, the biggest thing that's put WHO on the agenda recently, um, but in past years, other sorts of things, um, WHO is, does a lot of work in monitoring, collecting data, uh, sharing data, so that states can be better protected from disease. The World Bank uh, does an immense amount of work, again, in studying problems of economic development and underdevelopment, in gathering up money that can then be lent to states that need, uh, develop, uh, that need aid for development. And so again, lots of work being done there. Now, the World Bank uh, is controversial in some respects. Um, we'll talk about that later in the quarter when we focus on economic development. Um, States form international organizations to help them facilitate cooperation. So even before they have an agreement, um, or in order to make an agreement work better, they often will form international organizations. So the World Trade Organization exists really to help states reduce tariffs. And tariffs are immensely complex, right? You think about, potentially at least, there's a tariff on every single good that gets bought and sold in the world. And there are tariffs, in theory, between every two countries in the world. So in other words, millions and millions of tariffs. Um, by, by helping uh, systematize and, and come up with classes of goods and rules that apply to classes of goods across groups of countries, the World Trade Organization makes managing tariffs immensely cheaper, right? while also having a mission to try to reduce tariffs over time. Um, 
a big issue in environmental cooperation, especially as we think about global warming, is having information that everybody can rely on. And so if you want information that the whole world is going to rely on, it helps for that information to be collected and produced by a worldwide body. And the UN Environmental Program does a great deal of that. Uh, lastly, I'll point to monitor compliance. In many cases, uh, states are hesitant to cooperate unless they're going to be sure that others are going to meet their obligations. That's particularly true as it comes to uh, nuclear power and, and their, its potential transfer to nuclear weapons. So the International Atomic Energy Agency, on behalf of the countries of the world, monitors compliance with uh, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and makes sure um, that states around the world are not diverting materials from peaceful nuclear programs into nuclear weapons. That's a lot of work in a lot of countries. Um, one of the big questions that, that you know, we think about, and maybe this is more of a question for scholars than for, um, than for practitioners, but nonetheless it's, it's interesting to think about, is do we think of, of international organizations as actors? That is to say, do they have independent agency? Are they independently um, shaping world politics? Or are they merely tools? And this is a long-standing debate. Uh, realists, basically, who are in the camp really that say only states matter, say international organizations simply reflect the wishes of the states that form them. And in fact, realists are going to say, and many um, economic structuralists will say this as well, that um, international organizations simply reflect the underlying distribution of power. Um, so they're not they're, there's no independent effect. They're just a way in which right the strong do what they can uh, to the weak. Liberalism um, has, has a very different perspective, and, and uh, liberalism basically argues, and this comes from a lot of organizational theory beyond international politics, that organizations gain their own autonomy, right? Just as we think sometimes bureaucracies get a lot of their latitude to do their own thing, well, these are in many respects international bureaucracies. And so liberalism sees, auto uh, sees IOs as gaining autonomy, becoming actors in their own right. For example, um, they, they set agendas, for important international discussions and meetings. And of course, if you get to set the agenda, you can have a big impact on what gets talked about and what doesn't, and therefore on what gets done and what doesn't. Um, but they also oftentimes will set standards or establish norms or, or promulgate what they think the standards and norms should be. And once they've done that, it's kind of natural for discussion to crystallize around those things. Um, economic structuralism uh, sees IOs as reflecting the interests of global capitalism and therefore of the wealthiest, most powerful states. So while economic structuralism focuses more on economics and less on other forms of power, the, um, the, the view of economic structuralists is, is actually fairly similar to that of realism. Constructivism sees international organizations as having a really big role, right? Because it, 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 um, constructivism sees the shaping of interests, identities, and norms as being really important and sees international organizations as uh, having some capacity to do that. Um, In that respect, constructivism is similar to the liberal position. Um, feminism does see international organizations as potentially being actors and, and really asks a different set of questions, which is a really uh, the question of to what extent are international organizations reflecting and perpetuating sort of the patriarchy that they see defining politics around the world, or to what extent are these organizations maybe some, some means of, of overcoming um, so a couple of examples that we've already talked about um, or that, that we just want to talk about. Uh, the World Bank, right, manages this vast program of global lending. I've, I've already mentioned it. But the key point here is um, it plays a role that government by themselves cannot, right? The World Bank is a, is a good example of something that I sort of often say about international organizations, which it's one that if it didn't exist, right, uh, the countries of the world would probably have to get together and, and invent it. Um, because it, it fulfills this important need. The World Health Organization, we could say much the same, same thing about that. And we, you know, while we're focused so much uh, uh, in the contemporary era on COVID, if you go back 50 years or so, or 60 years, um, the World Health Organization um, actually led the eradication of smallpox, right? Nobody gets smallpox anymore, right? It, it only exists in a couple of very secure laboratories, one in Atlanta, one at the CDC, and one in Moscow. Um, nobody even gets inoculated against smallpox anymore because the World Health Organization led a campaign in the 1950s and 60s that wiped it out. Um, of course, before that, it was responsible for millions and millions of deaths. Um, NATO. This is uh, just a, one I haven't talked about yet. 
NATO is, is, uh, is a particular uh, international organization of uh, about 25 members, the United States, Canada, and then a bunch in Western Europe. And it coordinates military co cooperation, right? NATO is essentially an alliance. And what, the reason I point to NATO is when we think about capabilities, right, things that an international organization can do, well, NATO can basically wage war, right? It can conduct very complex and sustained military operations like the no-fly zone over Libya in 2011 or bombing campaign against Serbia in 1999. NATO has a, a greater military capacity than almost any country in the world. Now, we can ask the question, how much autonomy does it have? It's not really clear that NATO can exercise any of this military capacity without the um, approval of the nation states that make it up uh, because, because essentially the pilots who fly the planes, the people who fuel the planes, most of them um, in some way or another uh, still report uh, to national leaders as well as to, as to NATO leaders. So NATO might not, might not be an international organization with a ton of autonomy, but it certainly um, has immense power to go do things in the world. And so all I really wanted to do by, in this introduction is give you a sense of the range of um, international uh, organizations and some sense of the kind of things that they can do um, and the variation among them. So hopefully I've done that.